my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven, and today we're working on building the Z-axis for the pick and place machine. If you remember from the very first episode, I had the nozzle very precariously positioned. That of course is totally not gonna work for picking components and placing them on board, so I need to have some ability to move the nozzle up and down. This is the, the final keystone of functionality for it to kind of have everything that a bare bones pick and place can have. It can pick things up and put them down. <laughs> and that's fundamentally what this machine's gonna be. All the other stuff is just fancy. Stuff is gonna be cool. So how do I plan on achieving this? There are a lot of ways to convert rotary motion from a motor into linear motion up and down. So I have a few options to pick from. There of course is the traditional lead screw method. This works pretty well. The components can be a little more on the expensive side. Not prohibitively expensive, but more than some other options might be. Some people have used this really creative like weight and belt system, where the only thing that's actually pulling the head down is gravity, but it's lifted up by a belt, like a timing belt. That's actually what controls all the other axes in this thing. And that works well too, but I don't like the idea of it only being driven down by gravity. In case something gets gummed up in the rail, it just would never fall down. I want it to be actively driven and positioned in both upwards and downwards directions. So that's out. The last option, and the one I think I'm going to go with, is a rack and pinion style. Rack and pinions are just super cool to begin with. But the reason I like it is it's pretty cheap. I can print the pinion that goes on the motor, and then I can laser cut out the rack that matches with it. And some people have done this really creative thing where they put two racks on either side of the same pinion, and one motor can drive two nozzles up and down, and the weight of both of them kind of equalize each other out so the motor doesn't have to work too hard, and you get two nozzles. So I think I'm gonna go the rack and pinion route, and I know what you're saying. Steven, in the last video, you talked about how bad you are at designing gears. Why would you go in and design gears again? That's a very good point. <laughs> It's probably not the best option, but this actually doesn't require a lot of precision. The nozzle that actually has the vacuum being sucked through it actually has a spring in it, so it's compliant when it goes down to pick stuff up. So even if there's some wiggle room, it's kind of okay. I'm planning on driving it down into the component a little harder anyway, because there's a compliant spring to accept that little bit of extra push. So even if it doesn't drive it perfectly, that's all right. Also, I can buy rack and pinions off the shelf. So if I decide I do need that precision, it's an easy drop and replacement. So now I'm gonna scoot on over to the computer, boot up Fusion, and see what I can do to make a rack and pinion style extruder head that we can slap on this sucker. To the computer! <laughs> Alrighty, we got a Z-axis. I love this thing. So the first thing that's immediately apparent is there's definitely some backlash. But again, like I said before, this is not really a concern. The nozzle has some compliance anyway, so it doesn't really matter. What I neglected to consider was the fact that cutting the laser in the acrylic is gonna cause a really tiny bit of kerf. If you don't know what kerf is, it's the amount of material removed when you're cutting or lasering through something. In this case, it's the actual acrylic that is vaporized by the laser. You're actually removing some material, and I didn't take that into consideration and offset by the kerf. So there's a little bit of wiggle room in there. Again, totally fine. It's just a little annoying. <laughs> As I was assembling this, I thought it was kind of silly to not just do the other design I showed you earlier with the two nozzles that are on either side of the one pinion, especially because, spoilers, I'm planning on adding a solder paste dispenser on this thing too. And I'm gonna need some way to move that up and down as well. So might as well kill two birds with one stone and put two nozzles on this one head. So I think what I'm gonna do is go back in a CAD and redesign this just kind of mirrored over so there's two of them. And then this one assembly should be able to move two nozzles up and down. Alrighty. Time to double this sucker up.
Check it out. I now have two carriages. Ah, oh, so cool. I also upgraded to a metal pinion. The printed one works pretty well, but it's better to get a metal one. Right now it's weighted pretty unevenly because there's nothing on the right side and I got my pick and place nozzle on the left. But when I add something to the right side, the weight will be more distributed. Doesn't really matter, this stepper motor is more than capable of picking the entire weight of this without a counterweight to help balance it out, so it's fine either way. I also opted for a printed piece for the little holster for my pick and place nozzle stepper motor. Now I can like actually pick things up. Not just like paper, but like components. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna put it on the pick and place, then I'm gonna write G-code to make this whole thing populate the LEDs on a glow tie. It's so cool. to describe how cool this feels. I have sunk hundreds of hours into this project so far, and this is, this is it. This is the whole point, is being able to pick up components and place them on a circuit board. And although adding the Z-axis is a relatively small component of that, it was the last thing that I needed, and now seeing it all together is like, oh, it's really cool. This definitely put it over a line for me of like, it's coming together. Now there are some things that need tuning. When the head placed the LEDs, it wasn't always really precise. Sometimes the component would like skip out a little bit and hop around and it wasn't exactly where it should have been on the pad. And I attribute that to two things. The first is I wrote all that G code that you just saw execute by hand. I just kind of jogged the machine over on top of a pad and I was like, yeah, that looks about right. And then I put that number in. So it's probably not at all precise. Ultimately, I'm gonna use a piece of software called OpenPNP to control my pick and place. It's this awesome piece of software that effectively is designed to run a hobbyist pick and place machine. It's super open-ended and you can modify it and integrate it with all kinds of extra wacky stuff that you wanna integrate with your machine. It's super cool. So ultimately when I'm pulling the positions of where all the components need to go from my Gerber file, like from the actual CAD, it's gonna be rock solid right where it needs to go. Me putting in a number that I think looks right is super imprecise and they're not gonna be spot on. The second thing that's gonna help this is adding solder paste. I ran this without solder paste because it was gonna be super messy testing positions over and over. But when there actually is solder paste on a board, it kinda acts like glue. And when the head drops the component on top, it'll stick in place and it won't skip around when the head comes back up. So that should also help a ton with making sure the component stays in the right place. I like could just fab boards now. <laughs> Holy guacamole. Okay, so now that I have basic functionality working on the main machine, it's time to get the feeder all buttoned up. The next episode, I think, is gonna be finishing up the feeder. It depends on how well it goes. <laughs> and then once that's operating, I'm gonna have to find some way to make the feeder talk to the machine. And that is actually a really hard problem that I've spent a ton of time behind the scenes working on. It resulted in me ending up developing my own communication protocol. <laughs> which may or may not have been overkill, but I don't care, it's been super fun, so whatever. Let me know in the comments how deep into that you want me to go because I can go really deep into that. <laughs> but if it's not interesting to you, let me know in the comments and I'll adjust accordingly because I could go on about it for a long time. And then it's solder paste dispenser? Okay, before I sign off, I got one more item on the docket. I started working on YouTube in earnest a little bit over a year ago now, and I never expected to get so much support and encouragement about my videos. And it is beyond cool knowing that I'm making something that you all enjoy. Today, I'm starting a Patreon. My ultimate goal for this channel is to make it my job to make videos for you all full time. Supporting me on Patreon is the best way to help make that happen, along with increasing the quality and the frequency of my videos. <laughs> if becoming a patron is something you'd like to do, there's a link in the description to my Patreon page.
That being said, watching and liking and subscribing also help my channel tremendously, and I am incredibly grateful to all of you that do that. Now, of course, with Patreon comes tears, so I thought of three interesting ones. If you think they are unbelievably stupid and you have better ideas of things that you think would be cool tiers, please let me know in the comments. But here's what I came up with. Numero uno, shout out in each video and I will write your name on my workbench for all of eternity. You will be commemorated and projects will be done upon your name. Oh, this one's $1 a month, by the way. Numero dos is the after show. This one's five buckaroos and you'll get access to the after show, which is going to be a video with all of the stuff that I cut from the main video. Every time I shoot a video, I shoot between one and two hours of footage and I have to cut it down to about 10 minutes. So I have a bunch of extra stuff that I ultimately don't put in the video. Plus I deeper dive into some of the engineering decisions that I made and problems I ran into along the way and a whole bunch of other thoughts about the project that didn't make it into the normal video. And third, and this one I'm really, really excited about is a Office hours is how I'm thinking about it. This one's 20 buckaroos, but the idea is once a week, I do a Google Hangout and anyone at this tier pops in and if you have a project that you're working on and you don't know where to go and you're stuck or whatever, we will hop on this Google Hangouts and we'll all chat about it together and figure out how to go about solving it, what sensor is best for it, what microcontroller, how do you 3D print this part, how do you go about designing it, what CAD software is best. We'll dive in and figure out how to go forward with it. I'm really excited about this. I get so many emails asking, what should I use for a microcontroller? How do I build this? How do I build that? And it would be cool to do it all in one place. I think that's gonna be so fun. <laughs> if you have thoughts on how I should make these tiers different or whatever, please leave them in the comments. I would love to hear your feedback. If you do decide to support the channel, thank you, by the way, thank you so much. There is a link in the description where you can become a patron. All right, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to check out my Instagram page where I post pictures and updates about my projects way before they come out on YouTube. And I'll see you next time. That's horrible. That looks so bad. <laughs>